James, we certainly appreciate your presence here at Setis University. Uh, you know, 2019 marks the 58th anniversary of our institution, uh, a commitment uh, that has lasted throughout the years to contribute to training and preparing uh, citizens with uh, moral and intellectual capacity necessary to participate significantly in uh, the social, cultural, and economic improvement of, of our country. Uh, the university is uh, composed of a number of stakeholders, uh, which includes obviously students, faculty, alumni, donors, or board members who are very engaged, and of course, our collaborators. collaborators. When we uh, talk about loyalty in organizations, we can think that the philosophy, the vision, and the mission and values uh, proposed by the guidelines of our own institution are sufficient for our collaborators to be loyal and engaged. However, uh, your keynote this morning uh, shows us that we still have some ways to go. So uh, can you share a little bit about your thoughts regarding what are the basic components on loyalty as applied to organizations? Yeah, so it's a great question. It's the one that everyone asks, and it's the, um, and it, so let me, let me distinguish between what most people think of loyalty and the way I, I define it. So a lot of people couch it in the terms of a, a brand, mm -hmm. that if I, if I um, uh, create a, a communication strategy that is consistent, then I can make people loyal that way. Loyalty is really just a, a relationship type. If I said that someone was loyal versus uh, transactional, um, everyone would at least know what transactional was. It means you did something for me, I did something for you in return, um, or even. You, no one would confuse that with being loyal. What I would say is if you took an objective view of the university and what you've done and what you're currently doing, it's really probably just transactional with everyone. Students come here, they pay a tuition, they get a, uh, an education in exchange for that. Um, everything you promise to them um, is what they're getting. The difficult thing for most organizations is they think that that baseline stays there, but the baseline keeps moving. So now let's say you offer a better experience, you make more promises to your students, you build better facilities, you offer more programs, and you tell the world that that's what you do at a high quality level. It goes back to being a transaction again. When you deliver that, exactly that, then that's what people expect. So every time you raise the bar for yourself as an organization, then all you're doing is raising the transactional exchange as well. Mm -hmm. So you're constantly chasing, well, how do I make people loyal instead of just transactional? And in that case, and especially I think at a university, it has to go beyond this exchange of what people are expecting. They're expecting to get an education. They're expecting you to have state-of-the-art facilities. They're expecting you to, to, to uh, provide them with the, the skills to get a job afterwards. What they're probably not expecting is to meet the best friends they've ever had in this world. It's the, what they're probably not expecting is to meet a spouse that they may end up marrying or to, to sit next to the person who will give them a job in the future. They're, those are the things that they're not expecting. That sense of community is what causes them to start feeling like this place went well beyond what even they promised me. And that's when you start getting uh, more loyal relationships outside of transactional. And that's difficult for most people to understand because we think we go to work every day, we work really hard, and we think that that's enough, and it probably isn't enough. So two things to piggyback on that question. First of all, what I'm hearing from the perspective of branding is that branding is a positive effort, but it's certainly not enough to build a loyal organization. Is that, is that a correct interpretation? Yeah. Okay. I, so I, I think of, uh, again, there are people who are, who are marketing experts and mm -hmm. PR experts. Uh, I deal with the neuroscience of, yeah. of loyalty. And I refer to that as communicating the signals that people need yeah. in order to build a loyal relationship. So they help communicate those signals, mm -hmm. but, it, but communicating, communicating is only one thing. There's an operational side to actually delivering on those signals. Okay. So uh, yesterday uh, on our drive over here, we were talking about residential life. Mm -hmm. The fact that CETIS doesn't yet offer a residential life, do you think that hinders uh, or, or somehow 
compromises uh, or potential to uh, generate more loyal communities? You know, that's my instinct, I, but um, I can't speak to how the, the cultural aspect of that either, because I know how strong the, the family unit is as a, um, to the culture uh, of Mexico. So t to expect someone to leave that and create a, a new community on, in a campus is different. But that's really been part of the success in terms of building these strong, loyal bonds mm -hmm. in, at, um, in the United States and other schools. If you could just imagine living with uh, 24 hours a day, going to dinner, sharing a room, sharing uh, intramural sports, whatever mm -hmm. it may be, um, you can't help but start to rely on those people even more than your own family in some mm -hmm. cases. They become more than friends. They become people who are your support system. Um, so even if you didn't do that, so uh, my instinct was that if, if you created, if you had people living here, that you'd probably find that. I think the interesting test for you would be to look at the strength of, of loyal behavior, whether it's giving or, or engagement or whatever it may be, um, of your alumni, mm -hmm. and see which of those were part of a sports team, mm -hmm. part of a social group here, Fraternity. Fraternity, whatever it may be. I think you'd probably find that there's a, there's a correlation between the two. So residential living is, is a different form of that, but it does, accomplishes a similar thing. Universities are complex animals. Uh, we have a multitude of stakeholders and constituencies, board members, donors, uh, alumni, employee, faculty, staff, students, parents in some cases. Um, Let's remove ourselves from the higher education landscape for a second and, and just ask to any organization, what are the elements that better correlate with building a loyal workforce that goes well beyond just merely doing their tasks that they're paid for and moving toward that end that you described in your presentation? Yeah, so... Um this is what I've told uh, a lot of people in the HR, either departments within organizations or industries. Um, so there's two ways to get to achieve behavior. You can either hire it because it already exists, or you could teach it. Um, teaching behavior is really difficult. Changing people's behavior is difficult, but it is possible. Um, most organizations have some level of, of training or development. Um, for their people, and um, and you kind of hope that it sticks, mm -hmm. but it's also an expensive way to do it. The better thing to do is to hire people who have the skills that that come in that you'd bring in with with those skills that can already build good relationships. Um, you, it's a lot easier to teach them the skill of the job mm -hmm. than it is to teach them the behaviors that will build the loyal relationships. If I interact with students. I may be great at my job, at the processing part of my job, but, if, but I probably don't realize the impact that I'm having on that student in their life cycle within the university. Once they become alumni, I will ingrain in them this idea of what the school is because of this interaction I had with them or the lack of interaction. And so they become gatekeepers. They become brand ambassadors, if you will, and uh, some people refer to that. Every person that, at, every student at the school, whomever they interact with, is causing them to feel or think something, either positively or negatively, about the school. So you mentioned signals earlier, and I adhere to the signaling theory. Um, what are the wrong signals for an organization to send to their employees? Uh, whether it's through processes, uh, guidelines, uh, what is it that we should be weary of and, and cognizant of so as to make sure that we are not eroding the loyalty that we are otherwise creating? So this is where um, it becomes work for any organization. This is where a lot of people opt out of this and say, okay, <laughs> we're not going to do that. But if you really care about that, what you need to do is you reverse engineer the things that I told you, those signals that I said cause people to, to be loyal. So making my life safer, making my life easier, and making my life better are the three triggers that cause us to be loyal. When you satisfy those things, you'll have someone loyal to you forever. 
If you reverse engineer that, then you need to ask your department, your staff, the university as a whole, what makes you feel unsafe? What, call, what, what puts you at risk? What makes you feel insecure? They'll, they'll have an easier time articulating that, mm -hmm. such as, you don't pay enough, so I can't pay my bills uh, every month, or I have to live in a place where I don't, where that's, that's not safe for me or my family mm -hmm. anymore. Um, the amount of workload uh, makes my life too difficult because I need, I need more help, I need assistance, I need a larger staff, or I need technology to, to do some of these things. And the third one, uh, as in terms of uh, purpose, can they, art can they articulate that? Can they, if, if you ask them, do you know what the purpose of our, our organization is here, and they state the mission, then it's different. Uh, or it's not enough. I'll give you an example of that. So I, I mentioned this yesterday to, to the group. Southwest Airlines is a U.S. Air, uh, airline started by a guy named Herb Kelleher. Herb Kelleher had this amazing sense of humor. He loved having people laugh and he loved people um, uh, uh, creating an organization like that. That became the purpose of Southwest Air. Now the mission of Southwest Airlines is pretty simple and standard to every other airline. You pick up people at point A, you deliver them to point B, and you don't crash in between. That's a mission. If the mission is to educate students here, that's what every school does. That's what every, every student expects. That's not a purpose. For Southwest Air, it was about making people laugh. When you think about how they communicate that or their branding efforts, then of course, if you said, we want to make sure that people are enjoying themselves and having a uh, having uh, the best time of their life. What color should we paint the planes? If they said, well, paint them white like everyone else, then you're not really aligning with what it is that he cared about, right? That's why they're blue, yellow, and orange clown cars. If you were training your flight attendants and you knew that the purpose was to make people laugh, then you don't give them safety instructions by talking into a microphone and having them read off a card. They play ukuleles, they sing songs, they juggle while they're doing it. They're constantly, everything is aligned with the purpose of the place. And the purpose is not the mission. So again, reverse engineering this, if you asked any department or anyone in your, in, whether it's faculty or staff, and said, what's the purpose of this university? If they state the mission, then you're not there yet. And if you haven't articulated what it is, I don't know what the, the, the the purpose should be clear to everyone as to what it is beyond just educating students. And, and that way, alumni believe it, they constantly support it. Board members believe it, they constantly support it. The community believes it, they constantly support it. You build a cohesive, loyal group because they know this is what that organization is trying to accomplish and what they do. Well, you mentioned Herb Kelleher from Southwest, and I can think about Sapos, and I can think about Apple, an example you often use during your uh, keynotes. Those companies had the benefit of having at the helm somebody who truly got the loyalty concept. Um, so my question would be, where should loyalty efforts start within a company? Should, they, should we expect it to trickle down from the top? Should they emerge? Is there a potential for them to flourish if they don't come from the CEO or the or the manager or, or the senior manager? Um, it's better if they do. Um, it's not. It's not. Um, ultimately, if you want people loyal to the entire organization, then it has to come from the top. But people could build and do build loyal relationships within even toxic organizations. There are people who are terrible leaders, bad but organizations. Maybe because of fear. It could be. It could be fear, um, but. In, in other cases, it could be, and we've all heard these stories where um, I, I hate the place I work, but I love my boss. Mm -hmm. I love my department. Mm -hmm. I wish it didn't have to be part of this organization because the organization doesn't get it, but we do. Um, that's a good leader at a micro level, at a sub level, being able to do those kind of things that I said. They understand their employees. They understand what they need. They make them feel safe. They protect them. They advocate for them. They fight for them. They do all kinds of things. Um, there's, there's a way that you could do it at a micro level, but if you want it at a macro, it has to come from the, from the top. And I think that um, 
in order to believe it, then they have to live it too. And it's why it's hard. So, so ultimately, you can build amazing revolutions um, with loyalty. In fact, it's the only, hate has never done it, um, greed has never done it. If you look at any movement, any, any activism, uh, any revolutions, anything that has kind of transformed the world, it is because a group of followers have banded together to stand up to something bigger. It's that notion that, so loyalty is about connections, that if I can form a connection with you, a strong bonded one, then we are stronger than either one of us alone. That's the value of it, right? So your university can, can't be only strong because of Dr. Leon. It has to be the entire network that's all doing it. That's what, the, that's, that's what has to happen. So he could set the example, he can fight for the, the, the things that you all agree need to be fought for, but ultimately everyone else has to carry it out. Good. So maybe last, uh, could you give us any message or words of advice for our MBA students? And bear in mind that most of them come from technical disciplines. Oh, so this is, a, um, this is interesting because w one of the things that I found over and over again in the, um, in the tech industry in particular, whether it's engineering or whether it's in uh, IT or, or program coding, anything like that, um, it's, not, it's not a universal claim, but they tend to be, um, uh, their personality types tend to be more process driven and mechanical driven and they and um, and they're not relationship builders in the traditional sense um, I'd say learn to be um, as good and as skilled as you are I can tell you from my experiences with Apple and Amazon and, and companies like that um, there are a lot of smart people in the world there are a lot of there's more smart people than you could you could even imagine that's not really what's going to get you what you want in terms of the job you want or the advancement you want. It's about forming connections with people. It's about building these kind of advocacies. So again, I put it under a simple umbrella of loyalty. It's really about relationships and can I create bonds with others knowing that all those connections that I form, how strong they are, mean that I have that much more support people advocating for me, forgiving me, protecting me, um, sharing things with me, than, I, than doing it on my own. If I do it on my own, it's too hard. The second thing that I would say is that there's, a, um, there's an opportunity to take advantage of what's changing in the world today if you understand the value of loyal relationships. And here's why I say that. There's three things in particular that I think people need to focus on. One is the The, uh, the fact that we have more choices than ever before and we can and easier access. So it used to be that if you wanted to buy something, you might have to buy it in your local store. 20, 30 years ago, that's what it was. If they didn't have it in stock, you didn't get it. You had to wait for them to order it. I can have an Amazon Prime uh, subscription and get it the next day, and I don't know where it's coming from, and I don't even know who sold it which means that the abundance of choice and exposure I have leaves me, if I'm that little store owner, pretty vulnerable, unless I was able to build strong relationships with my customers for reasons beyond just that product I'm going to sell. So that's the first. The amount of choices people will have in terms of hiring you or, or doing business with you will be greater than ever before. If you think that they're going to just come to you because you created the greatest widget that's ever been created, maybe you will but most likely you're going to offer a service or a product that is ubiquitous, that, that other people are going to offer. They'll find it cheaper. They'll find it faster somewhere else. So that's the one thing. The second is that technology is replacing humans in a lot of cases. Artificial intelligences, robotics, all those kind of things. Um, if I want to keep my job, and my job is potentially one that can be eliminated, they used to only be factory people, factory workers that said, well, I'm vulnerable to robotics. Artificial intelligence is replacing analysts all, all the time today. Again, 
how someone is going to choose who do we keep, who do we get rid of, is based on the relationships I have and how much value I bring back to that organization beyond the transactional job. Um, and the third one, which is kind of this growing thing, is the amount of misinformation that is accumulating and is becoming more prevalent. That this idea of fake news and deep fakes and, and it, it goes to the heart of who do I trust? What's the source of information for me to trust? Either an organization or, or, um, or it's not even just media. If, if I knew that I was getting a, a, a newsletter from Setis that I knew was right and correct and, and thoughtful and researched and I start to believe that maybe more than my, what I'm reading on my Facebook feed. So we're going to start choosing who are the, what are the sources of our information. And if you can build an organization that is centered around establishing that trust and, being, and knowing that whomever is doing business with us, that they can trust us, it's going to separate you just because of that, that alone. So. Great. That's great advice. Okay, good. James King, it's Thank been you. a pleasure Thank having you. you here. Thank you very Thank much. You.